Welcome back to the Orthodox Universalist channel. Today we're covering questions 6 and 11 from the Gospel Coalition's article entitled 12 Questions for the Would-Be Universalist, written by Michael McClymond in December 22. So let's dig in. For question 6, TGC asks, Doesn't the New Testament show that salvation is connected to faith? A concordance will show that the words faith and believe, with their cognates, appear over 500 times in the New Testament. But how is this tight connection between salvation and faith consistent with universalism? The universalist is bound to say that either one, people in the present life who don't seem to be believers really are believers in some hidden or cryptic fashion, or two, that people who depart this life in unbelief get a further opportunity to become believers after death, see also question 11, or three, that salvation isn't tied to faith, despite the biblical witness to the contrary. None of these three options is congruent with Scripture. So I think most Christian universalists would agree that option 1 and 3 aren't compatible with the Bible. So let's set those aside for the moment. But as TGC points out, option 2 is closely connected with their 11th question. So let's go ahead and read that as well. There they ask, Is it plausible to believe that there will be a second chance for salvation after death? If there is such a second chance, then it's never clearly presented or described in Scripture. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25 emphasizes the limited time and opportunity that humans have to respond to God, and it implies a time will come when the door to the wedding feast will be shut, and it will be too late to enter in. One key text appears in the Gospel of Luke. Someone said to Jesus, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Jesus' message is explicit. Some people, or rather many, will wish to enter God's kingdom, but will not be able. Take heed. So let me begin by saying that it's pretty difficult to see something if you're convinced that it's not there in the first place. If we come to Scripture already persuaded that there's no hope of saving faith after death, we're fairly unlike to see, unlikely to see such hope, even if it is staring us in the face. While the passages that TGC has selected do seem on the surface to paint a conclusive picture, let's consider what else Christ had to say concerning the kingdom of God. In the article, Michael McClymond is quick to point out that the destiny of the lost seems to be final, as it's described in Luke chapter 13. But he fails to reckon with the more hopeful message that dominates Luke chapter 15. There the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling, because Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. Don't miss the importance of this. All that's about to be said by Christ in Luke chapter 15 is connected to his attitude towards sinners. He's not talking about people that are in a good relationship with God. He's not talking about people that have already come through faith into a right relationship with Him. And he doesn't kick off his response by first saying, well, if people just have faith, this is how I'll treat them. Rather, he makes incredibly hopeful, incredibly confident assertions about how things will go in the future for sinners. In verse 4, Jesus asks, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And in verse 8 he asks, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? The answer to these questions is obvious. Contextually, we're still talking about sinners. Subject hasn't changed. And Jesus makes the bold statement that even one sinner lost is too much. Like any responsible owner of sheep or coins, he, as the implied owner of sinners, will pursue them until each and every one is found. TGC puts an extensive amount of emphasis on our attitude towards God, but fails to take into account God's unchanging nature and the natural conclusion concerning his attitude towards us. Faith isn't just an exercise of man drawing near to God, but also the result of God drawing near to man. 
that such an exercise would for some reason cease when a man dies doesn't seem compatible with the orthodox idea of God's unchanging nature. Consider what Christ says about God the Father in Matthew 5. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, are we to assume that God's attitude towards his enemies changes when they die? Are we to assume that in order to be like the Father, our attitude towards our enemies will need to shift upon death? That is to say, being like the Father while our enemies are alive means loving them, but being like the Father when they die means hating them? Still, the finality of the condition that is portrayed in passages like those describing the ten virgins and the narrow door should be sobering. We should, as TGC recommends, take heed. Yet this finality can't be used as a syringe to suck the implications out of all the hopeful text about the kingdom. We can't interpret scripture against scripture and abrogate one passage because of another. Instead, we need to set scripture with scripture and understand the truth with the whole picture in view, at least as much as we can see it in this life. So when we consider the fate of those who have been shut out of the kingdom, we have to ask ourselves two further questions. First, what will they experience outside the door? And second, will the door ever be opened again? I believe scripture has something to say in both of these areas. Returning to Matthew 5, we find that Christ describes divine punishment quite forcefully. He talks about it as fiery and states that it would be better to cut off a hand or gouge out an eye than to experience it. If we stop even briefly to really think about these statements, we can't escape the fact that Jesus wanted to elicit a sober-minded, even visceral response from his audience. Straight through from verses 22 to at least 30, Jesus is explaining how our actions in this life have extremely painful consequences. Moreover, those who hold to the conventional view consistently interpret this message to be describing eternal punishment. Ellicott, Benson, Henry, Barnes, and many other commentators all confirm that this text is not about earthly torments. This point can't be overemphasized because it's curious that right in the middle of this commonly used hell proof text, we find undeniable evidence that there is a possible end to the suffering that will be experienced. Consider verse 26. Jesus says, Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Ellicott, in his commentary for English readers, while not wanting to express too much hope, admits that the chance of a future repentance can't be denied. He says, There may be a suffering that works repentance, and the repentance may lead to peace and pardon. There may be but this is the very utmost that can be said. So what might the experience look like for those who find themselves outside the door of the kingdom? It will be inescapable and painful until the last penny has been paid. The Christian Universalist doesn't deny the severity of divine punishment, but points to passages that clearly indicate the purpose and the limit of that severity. But let's consider the door to the kingdom itself. As TGC has already noted, it's described as narrow, and there will come a time when it will be shut. In the former case, the Universalist doesn't find an issue. Even if there is a vast network of roads that lead away from God, like wrong paths in a maze, given a long enough time, it's only logical to assume that eventually everyone will find the right road. Don't misunderstand this point. Not all roads lead to God. Christ Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and there is no other. But the idea that the road in him and through him will somehow disappear for unbelievers when they die is a step too far for universalists. The narrow way is eternal because Christ is eternal, and he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. But more sobering than the concept of the narrow door is the idea that the door will one day be shut. Some will come knocking and requesting entry into the kingdom of God but they'll be denied this. Yet while such statements clearly indicate a fixed experience outside the kingdom, 
they don't speak to the duration of that experience. As we've already seen, there are at least strong implications that the last debt that ties an unbeliever to the prison outside the kingdom can be paid, and they can, to quote Jesus, get out. But is the door described in any other context? The answer is yes. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22, John prophesies by the Spirit about the new Jerusalem, the city of God that will descend out of the new heaven and exist on the new earth. This is the final form of the kingdom that we're given a glimpse of in Scripture. In chapter 21, we read that by its light, the nations will walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. And in chapter 22, we read, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So though the door to the kingdom is narrow and will at some point be shut, we have a clear indication that the door will one day be reopened and will never close again. Furthermore, we are told that the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the kingdom. Yet at the same time, we read that outside the city are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Inside the city are the saints. Outside the city are the sinners. Yet some who are outside will come inside. It's hard to imagine that those who are entering into the city are the saints unless they've been spending time outside the city for some unknown reason. The case could be made then that the door is always shut to sinners, yet in another sense, the door is always open so that if they wash their robes, they can gain the right to enter the city. The bottom line is that the idea of there being no opportunity to repent after death is not compatible with Scripture. And the argument that the door to the kingdom, when shut, will never open again is also not compatible with Scripture. Now, if you're watching this video and you're on the fence about whether or not to embrace this whole Jesus thing, don't wait. He's the King and the Savior of all people, but especially of those who believe. And the journey of following Him, the journey of discovering His infinite kingdom, can begin right now. Thanks for hanging out with me as we discuss two more questions from the Gospel Coalition's article, 12 Questions for the Would-Be Universalist. Join me next time as we discuss question seven. Like and subscribe and even share if you like the video. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel. Mm -hmm.